Today is August the 8th, 2020. This is the Service Hero Show, 365 Days of Awesome, Celebrate Success Through Service. I am your host, Tamara Hunter, and this is the show that tells the inspiring stories of those that are inspiring others. So let's do this. Today, I want to recognize uh, Scene Chicago, Scene Chicago TV and radio. They have been a supporter of this show and myself for a while since I've won the next Impactor, and they have been sharing out our content. I want to officially say thank you to them today and that we appreciate the share, we appreciate the support, and the Chicago area, of course, yesterday it was announced that there will be a second season of The Next Impactor and The Next Global Impactor. Very excited about that, so I wanted to say officially thank you. And now we are going to introduce you to our nominated service hero, a gentleman that is actually a hero. He is uh, sharing heroes in multiple different ways. He was recognized by and nominated by this dear person with the blue hair. Yes. Our dear friend of the show. And as she says, I say my name correctly because that's how she says her. Tamara Lenan. Anybody that knows Tamara Lenan knows that she is just a fun person. So I thought I'd recognize her <laughs> by her avatar, her cartoon, and say thank you, Tamara, for introducing us to Daniel. Daniel Faust is a gentleman that is a true hero. He has served our military. He is helping our military families, those that are now veterans and first responders, along with all of us, how to live better and to be able to uh, find the joy and even more in our lives and in our families. So I want to recognize Daniel and say thank you for your service and welcome to, to the Service Hero Show. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And we were just talking, and this man is very interesting. He, he's a full he's full time uh, in the military, and he's got a business that he's out there educating. He's got a podcast. He's got a radio or a TV show, and he writes books. He also has this adorable family. How is it that you have all the time to do all of this? Well, the first off thing is that. You learn technology. I have 15 years of prior IT experience, so I've used a lot of technological things to make things easy. And secondarily, uh, when I was that war hero mentality, I did everything and committed to everything. That transformation to superhero is deciding the tyranny of the urgent. Everybody's saying, hey, do this, do this now. I stopped. And that was about 15 years ago. I'd highly recommend reading that book, The Tyranny of the Urgent by Charles Hummel. It's a 15-page book that just gets your perspective to what's important compared to what's urgent. So, yes, I have four kids. I'm full-time. I'm doing this stuff. But I'm not overloaded because I decide what's important compared to, like, hey, do this, do this, do this. So that's how mm -hmm. I do it. You know, and, and I love that. And I'm recognizing many that are here. In fact, we are uh, recognizing right now. Yes. Hey, Tamarella Nan. I wanted to just say love the image. <laughs> and, and thank you for nominating Daniel. And you're right. He is definitely someone that we need to 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 highlight and to learn from because you, what you're just sharing right now and in today's world and that's why i'm now dating the shows rather than numbering them as i used to is that we need to be conscious of 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 the of the stress if you will of even that do this do that do this now do that now there's enough upside down and all the way around going on for many not all but many they're feeling that that life has changed a bit and and finding their way with that and right now is a great time for us to learn to live learn new habits learn how it may serve us 
to maybe make a few shifts, a few changes, right? I totally agree with that. In, in a pre-COVID, post-COVID, or whatever we're COVID world in, and we need to take this opportunity as the world is shifting and pivoting and our lives are flanking, we need to decide what's important and not important. One of the recommendations that I recommend on my show to the couples, I said, we need to shift and pivot to have one income to support and the other one to defend. Back in 2008, people were living on a two income uh, economy. And then when it crashed, one spouse or the other lost their income. And they would totally crash them because they were living on two income mentality. So like one of the things I make lives easier is one income supports the other one defends. So you now have to decide if you go towards that mentality is like, now you have that freedom to say, hey, if one spouse wants to go or the other one needs to pivot and whatnot, you're not relying on that two income thing. And especially with COVID, 28 million Americans are getting affected because of school, single moms, single dads. We have all the other people. If we go to remote school, each place is deciding. Mine decides on Monday. So I'm like, make a decision. But, you know, <laughs> if, and, and if we keep allowing the world to make decisions on things instead of us learning from what's in front of us and then living, then we're going to keep running in that tyranny, the urgent, and we're going to collapse ourselves. I mean, my life became so much easier when I just supported that is that some seasons my wife was supporting the income and I was defending it by taking on the other things. And then she would then she shifted over and I got a $35 an hour job and she was at 13 and it was going away. And I'm like, all right, you can come home and I'll take over. You know, because realistically, if you have a husband, wife or a couple's income, most of the time you're shifting that to childcare anyway. It's like you have to make at least $20 plus to do the both support support mentality. So that's one of the things that we share with our people because most of those people are limited income, twenty five to eighty five thousand. That's most of our audience. Yeah, and 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 excellent information. I wanna I wanna drill down on that and I wanna recognize many that are here. And yeah, Spencer Rose, you are just amazing. And yes, your town, Chicago. Glad you're here with us. Uh, uh, Ariel, Ariel, good afternoon, Ariel. Thank you for your service. Another military um, a lady, wonderful. And one of our senior ambassadors of the buddies, Carol Bear. Better Zins, uh, welcome. We're glad you're here with us. Sherry, another senior ambassador. Good afternoon. And, and you know, I uh, still morning, huh? It's still morning to a trapper. Yeah. And, you know, uh, the, the idea, how smart is that? Because I, I actually, this morning I go on morning walks and they've been walks and talks really more or less. We've been time to move. It's time for us to move time for us to be moving forward. Too many people have gotten kind of stuck because when we were first told that, that we had to change and shift a bit in our lives, it was only represented as a very short period of time. We were only going to have to do this, you know, it, guys, it's an adjustment. We're going to have to do this for so long and then we'll be good. We'll be back to normal, quote unquote. And 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 then, you know, we'll we'll go from there. Well, now we're into this for months mm -hmm. and and it it obviously like we're waiting like you're <laughs> you're waiting here about the school. And and we've been yeah, we've been hearing about schools. Around. Oh, man, everybody's been really i mean it's it's a collective I, i'm a nana now and yet the school thing is it's serious you have to figure it out even within the families and then and and what state are you if or you can even hire a teacher or a tutor these days you know and it's interesting when it comes to that and so the idea of uh support and defend you know it, that that is absolutely genius this morning we were talking about um how it, it's important to be prepared it's important to have you know you, you're if you will like if you live in a certain area and you need your bug out you know 72 hour uh backpack just in case you need to leave for you know temporarily for a little while and to be safe and what you're saying as someone that's been in the military and uh, with the roles that you have played that why not use some of those strategies and and implement them in our family, uh -huh. live within our means, live within 
the means of possibly one of the incomes and then use that other income possibly what for saving or or putting aside or or not have to have it or i want to drill a little deeper into that so what support and defend means is that basically let's say for example i'm making fifty thousand a year if i can go over and realistically look at that main income supporting all the majors the housing the electric the food all those types of things the defend is like things that you consider that are not absolutely important but they're ex, you know ex, like accessories so for example okay vacation savings those types of things that's where it defends those things that are now important to the family but not essential supporting okay. is essential items defending is things that you want for quality of life like for example a lot of times like um let's say you like streaming content and you watch a bunch of streaming content that could be a defend we think it's good for quality of life but if push comes to shove it's like if that income goes away, you're not like, oh, I'm devastated. My rent is due. Oh, I'm devastated. This is this. So that's what I go over and do is that all my income from my day job supports and the rest of it defends. We tend to not follow principles we take in business and apply it in the bedroom. In the bedroom, you go over and say, OK, one income or two incomes. Those two incomes become one income. We're relying on that. In a business, they never rely on just one sole income or stream, as we call it. They have five to seven revenue streams. The average American pre-COVID is going to take $5 million to go and retire. So let's go over and support for the now. And then everything else is defend for the future. Because defense comes up occasionally, support is always there. So that's why I look at it from my my fifty to sixty thousand dollar income supports all the majors so then my family doesn't have to worry about the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Defend is like more of things that are coming up upfront, unexpected bills, those types of things. So I can continue to go support the things that are sustaining. So that can use it from that analogy too. And then looking at it from is my second income, if I have a second income, defending what? Because more than likely you're especially if you have early kids you're, you're actually just supporting yourself going to work. So $20 an hour. And unfortunately, ladies earn less. It's unfortunate we should be equal, but let's call it reality that 10 out of uh, 10 to 40 percent wage gap is in there. The lady goes to work, makes 10, 15, 20 dollars an hour. They deserve the same as men. I, I'm totally agree with that, but just let's do reality. They say they make $20 an hour. Childcare is an average 250 to 500 a week. That's like, let's go on the low end, $1,000 a month, high end, $2,000 a month. You do the simple math, you're losing $10 an hour just for the childcare. If the school is up and rolling, you still have after school care, you know, a couple hundred bucks, gas, everything else. When, especially if you're a couple coming together and you have the opportunity for both of you to work, it should be more of a defense. Like a lot of my jobs sometimes when my wife was working, it was online, gig, short term, hustle type money. And then when I went back to the $35 an hour job, she went back to more defending that type of thing. And she also defended the income, saying, like, reminding me, it's like, hey, you know, let's go eat at home. That saves mm -hmm. a lot of money. So they go instead of eating out. Hey, uh, let's wait three days and pray about this before we go over and buy it. Because especially when you're two incomes and you look at it as both support, support, you're like, I need to support myself. I need to support my hobbies. I need to support everything else. So it gives that mentality of both sides. It's like, and then they come back one spouse or the other then looks at it, it's like, okay, it's a holistic income. That's where I think of support and defend because now you have two distinct roles and you're both going over coming as the overall to bring everybody up. Okay. That's, a, you know, good, a lot of good points there. Lots of good points. And I want to point out, you're talking about your, your beautiful wife and these amazing little guys, you know, um, and and I was I was thinking I was actually talking about that this morning um, that when when I was a, a, a single mom most of the time when my kids were growing up and I had four kids and so I would be that that person I did have to have I actually was the one that had to have multiple income streams and 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 there are many that have had to do that today however you know there's there's a lot of changing taking place i'm not going to say that there's not the opportunity for multiple income streams but possibly they're looking different than they used to because you know you can be watching the news you can be driving around in your community and you see 
this has just closed. That is temporarily closed. This has shifted. You cannot go in, but you may be able to get out, you know, service to come out. Whatever yeah. it may be, there might be some different um, uh, choices when it comes to some of those opportunities to have those income streams coming in and with 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 today's world that makes it even that much more difficult yet not impossible so are you seeing because of the fact that you do interview uh, on your podcast you are interviewing on your show you mm -hmm. are involved in your seminars and such things are you seeing more and more people finding ways to um, create those income streams online or in other creative methods that will allow for, if you will, like you said, the COVID world that we're in right mm. this minute? What are you seeing with that? I'm seeing people going over and shifting and pivoting. I'll give a perfect example. Yesterday, two boys, 10 years old on the base went over and created a need based generated item they went over and said hey let's help you take care of the lawn so you can focus on your family these boys are only 10 years old and they found something that was a need within that base it, they, they didn't do it pre-covid they, they didn't exist but they've already earned 400 dollars just in a matter of two months we need to go over and figure out ways to pivot in a need slash want mentality. A lot of my speakers and trainers that I know and friends and whatnot, because I used to do speaking and training across the nation, is that they went over and went to an online platform. They went over to a maybe Patreon model, which you'll have to find somewhere else, I guess they're going under. But anyway, find a membership type system to then go support those speaking engagements. Or they found maybe direct sales or MLM, or if you find a needs or a deeply seated want in this season, like if we could attract all the things, things for people buying every single week, like the people that took the, what was it they, oh yeah, hand sanitizer the first couple weeks. Right. People were selling that like hotcakes. Yeah, some people did it wrong, but we need that entrepreneurial spirit saying like, what is COVID gonna go generate? I know people that are selling masks. I almost did it myself. That's a need, but then it brings morale as a want. If you have like a smiling face, you can see your face, or if you make a clear screen or someone has the visor now with the thing, those are the types of ideas that we need to go over and do. And there's still several contactless opportunities. Lots of companies are saying, hey, we're still doing delivery. We have tens of thousands here, tens of thousands here. Because every eight years, we have the economy that's going to go pivot. It pivoted in 2001 with 9-11, unfortunately. It pivoted in 2008 with the crash. 2015, we kind of got skipped, but now we're kind of catching up. It's usually every seven years, if you look through history, it's just something that happens. So we need to be prepared to say, hey, just like an average person shifts their job nine or 10 times in a season, we need to be looking at the economy every five to 10 years and saying, what needs, wants, and desires could I meet in this season and then pivot over? So it doesn't matter where you're at because there's still opportunities. There's even opportunities to earn money watching ads, like through clicksters. There's like a beta test for that right now, just as oh. an example. Watching ads? Yeah, clicksters is a beta test. I think they're gonna start in the next 60 or 90 days, but you got paid basically up to $10 a day to watch ads for people and they do use you as a bait, use you as a test before they send those ads out to the public through oh. different digital means. I got involved in that. I also got involved into a beta podcast app called Tadopolo. It's a dynamic interactive podcast that now sponsors pay you for them being on there and you get about 20% rev share. So if you're in the podcasting world, they still have one more beta test and then they pay 20% dividends in there. So there's places to earn revenue. You just have to be flexible on saying, hey, I am not just Sergeant Faust or first responder this. It's a, who am I serving and how can I serve them well? And then find those places. It's an ends to a means. Yeah. I've had this conversation with my son today about you want to be a Minecraft guy, but might, you might have an opportunity to do a needs-based thing in the short term to empower you to become a Minecraft server guy. I love it. How old, how old is, is, is this one? Um, Your son. Yeah, that's about two years old, but yeah, just give him longer hair. It looks about the same, but uh, <laughs> he's, uh, 
He's, uh, he will be 13 uh, in October. Uh, Faith is the one in the stripes, and she it will be she's 11 and a half. And the twins, Hope and Trinity, Trinity's in the orange, and Hope's in the black. They're both 10. Oh, you have twins! Wow, wow, mm -hmm. <laughs> busy house. Wow, yeah, busy house. So okay, so learn and live. You mentioned in okay in the bedroom. Now you mentioned that because of the fact that that's that's what that's more associated with the idea of home and family versus work and the office or boardroom yeah so from the bedroom to the boardroom our entire show and our entire premise learn and live is the father company in a sense and then war hero to superhero is the show that delivers the information so we help military veterans first responders transform from the bedroom to the boardroom because in my experience and almost losing my marriage, losing my family, breaking my back a few years ago, so many other stories I can go into. But long story short, all those, you know, li live it out and then learn mentalities kept coming in my life with almost losing my marriage and my kids almost dying and all these other crazy stories I've had. I said, this is totally asinine. I'm so tired of hearing live and learn, live and learn. We should learn and live. And I kept saying it for a while. And I'm like, that's my rebrand. After I broke my back, I'm like, that's my rebrand. Instead of being perspectives and reflections, if anybody's been tracking me for a while, yes, it wasn't a spa company, but we rebranded under Learn and Live. And when I broke my back at 17, I'm like, I really need to focus on the people I love as the military veterans and first responders. That was the main people I was serving, but I was in fear of serving them because, you know, hey, if I serve everybody, I can get a little bit off everybody instead of serving a few and then making a lot so then I can serve more. So that's why we rebranded, but we focus on, we get it backwards. We like, let's fix our boardrooms. Let's go fix our lives. Let's go to this emotional class. Let's go to this relationship class. Let's go to this behavioral class. But we don't do that in the marriage. We don't do that in the family. And the average divorce impacts six to 24 months at minimum, fiscally, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, socially. So. I've had to re reverse engineer my entire life. Uh, I had to get spiritually kicked in the you know where to reinvent my life. And I'm like, I know other people are struggling the same thing. They, they will go from this face to face, then go shoulder to shoulder, then go back to back, you know, and then they drive away. And typically, then it's over time they divorce or, and that happens everything. The, and then everything gets affected. So if we focus first from bedroom overflow into the living room and they overflow into the boardroom, then you're thriving no matter what season we go through, COVID or not. Uh, Ariel is saying, lucky, I want twins. I always want babysitting. You just have to move. <laughs> and Andrea, good to see you here today. And yes, time to move today. Hashtag time to move. All right. So, you, you mentioned breaking your back in 17. What happened there? Uh, I had injuries from all the military stuff I did. I was documented at 40% disability once I got out of the service. And I had my end of month, beginning of the month pain. And I always called it my VA senses tingling. So it happened once a month. I would get sore. I would deal. I would soak. I would do whatever. In 17, we were... We've gone almost homeless three separate times because of the transition. That's another reason why our business started. In 17, it was November of 17, and I was on annual tour. And Monday, I was hurting. It was getting towards payday. So I'm like, eh, it's VA census, whatever. But it got worse. So then I canceled my PT test. And then I got to, like, Wednesday, and I was at a three or four. And I'm like, okay, it's getting towards the beginning of the month, whatever. It'll heal off when some money comes to the account. That was my theory because every month that happened that way, the money heals me, whatever. So, <laughs> so November 2nd comes up of uh, 2017, and it's right before drill weekend. I'm a unit training manager. So I'm managing 150 people, all their training and education, through 28 different jobs in this medical unit. I'm like the only one available at the time and I had to go and I was hurting really bad that morning and I told my wife I said what are we going to do we're really struggling I said as the Lord is my witness I'm going to defend this family I'm going to defend this marriage I walked out the door and my back went from a four to an eight and I dropped in the parking lot luckily my knees caught me but the pain caught me so bad I almost hit the concrete I asked the Lord for strength I got back down to a three or a four. I crawled to the car. I drove an hour. 
pain subsided to it too. I'm like, okay, random spaz, whatever. I get out of the car again after the hour drive. I went back to an eight, almost dropped on the concrete outside my unit and literally had to army crawl into the unit. About halfway the distance in, I'm like, this is asinine. It's 2017, I have a phone. So I call my chief, I said, chief, I said, I'm kind of hurting and I can't move. Can you help me out? She's like, what? I said, yeah, I'm outside in the concrete right now. She's like, what? And it's a medical unit. So the medical people took me in and then I realized I busted my L4, L5 and S1. Like I herniated those discs. I already had the documented problems. I just never herniated them before. And I literally was out of commission for like two days. And then I had to go from not walking to fully walking. I had to learn that transition. And that's when I had a couple of gentlemen come in the hospital and went over and challenged me. And they told me, you should get rid of your business. You should get out of the military, get a 10 to $15 an hour job and work your way back up to take care of your family. That was the most hateful moment and the best moment of my life. The most hateful moment because you're challenging me saying I'm not a good dad, I'm not a good husband, I'm not a good military man. The best part was is it finally said I'm not going to allow anybody to conform me to what they think is going to be. And you don't have investment in my life to even speak this because I spoke in your, I spoke my life out forward and be vulnerable, but you never shared life with me. So I just decided I'm like I'm going to get up and walk and do what God's called me to do and not live in fear anymore. So I pressed on and after months and then those relationships decided I just decided I'm like I can't keep going over not serving I, I kept trying to serve everybody like hey if I serve all relationships and all things this will get up and rolling nope I said nope I gotta serve the people I love even though it's scary even though fiscally it could be you know very little but I need to go serve those people and that's when we pivoted to business and that's when I pivoted my life because I did it the first time in my marriage in 2013 when I got seriously kicked there 17 was now saying, now I need to take the boardroom and repivot. So I was taking those steps one at a time. Bedroom was first, living room was after that, and then boardroom. So that was the whole transformation. So I'm very thankful that happened because it made me solely focus to say, I need to serve these people well. We need to make them transform from war heroes to superheroes. So that was like the transforming day. Wow. That, that, that's incredible. <laughs> and I have to say, I love the, I love the line. This is, this is 2017. I've got a phone. I mean, you know, <laughs> cause, but when you're in the middle of something like that and that, that is where you need to. And I love the idea of first responders and the military and, you know, any time you've, you've seen any of the type of training that it's repetitive, which I'm not a repetitive type of person. I'm a think outside of the box, you know, A to Z to M that day, and then, you know, T to X to Y, and then the next day, whatever. But but the idea that you need to train the brain, and, and we're doing it now in the morning, we, you know, make your bed, bed check, right? Okay, mm -hmm. get up water stretch you know time to move let's get let's go let's get unstuck from what's happening whatever's keeping us stuck and it's that repetitive action and doing it for a period of time that it becomes muscle memory they say you know and so the <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 just cracking up about that because you know we don't always think in terms of sometimes the obvious we think in terms of what we've been training ourselves and mm -hmm. and in that situation you're in a lot of pain your mind's not possibly totally engaged because you're thinking about the pain mm -hmm. and it's like okay oh that's right this is addition to that and so when you can prepare yourself for those un unwanted possibly but yet life experiences uh such as what we're all in today uh where we have all of these new experiences and opportunities in our lives your lessons that you're talking about and the fact that if you if you start taking these steps then it can become more of a family unit muscle memory situation where it can help in the marriage and mm -hmm. help and the and having the financial uh, you know having that financial thing taken care of having your core values having having all of these things kind of under control then it's going to help 
when whatever storm may come right that that we you're you're building that strong unit if you will that strong unit that's called a family it's not just the military or the first responders you're you're bringing some of that to the bedroom correct it's going over and becoming together like you saw that picture about the values spiritual gifts and uh what does it talk about uh past experience is one of the things that we went through it's called a kazone it's a greek word for dream vision and destiny and when you bring that in the bedroom and you both come together then you can now outpour into that living room into your family which is that legacy that carries and now you can pour into the boardroom and now you're truly doing what you're called to be compared to just doing something and that changes your life so you can go over and take those mentalities that we were talking about about support and defend and everything else and now you're universally on the same page together. That's our hope with Learn and Live and then our show, War Hero to Superhero, is for you to transform from that War Hero to Superhero and glean on what we give you and then also bring conversation to the table so we can bring the best of the best. Daniel Faust is not going to go over and keep this business up and rolling. It is going over. It's going to be a village of a community bringing the best of the best wisdom forward to go over and to grow. So I can then go over and focus well in my bedroom, in my living room too, as I go over and do that with everybody else. So then that boardroom comes together and then other boardrooms come together. We kind of get convoluted sometimes when we try to do everything. My goal is to go over and make you thrive in those three areas and anything else that's not in that role, then I'm going to say this boardroom is better for you in that particular realm. So that's our heart and our goal is to get you to thrive from the bedroom to the boardroom. I love it. So, so tell me about this. What is FATS? Um, it is an analogy my friend Dale Black taught me a long time ago in Ohio. I was a mental health technician at the time, and he was my spiritual accountability partner. This guy is like wise beyond years. Avid golfer. He worked in the diesel mechanic world for about 35 years. He just retired just recently. He's out of Wright Pat Air Force Base, prior veteran. And he's like, he kept mentioning about good facts. And I'm like, what do you mean by good facts? You got to be faithful. You got to be available. You got to be teachable. And you got to be a servant. Those are the things that go over and carry. No matter if it's you're dating somebody, if you're going over and teaching your kids those attributes, and also going over in the workplace. Like, I want to hire people that are faithful, available, teachable, and a servant. And I have to see those things through and through. And when you have good facts compared to bad facts, then you go over and thrive in there. So that was a more of a holistic change your mindset and what do you need to go in that area? Because I was a very available person at the time, but I wasn't a faithful person. Teachable, it depended on the day. You know, I'm, I'm still kind of hard headed. I'm like, I love teaching, but when someone brings something to me, I'm initially a fighter. And then that servant is going over and serving that community. Because when you truly do that, no matter what job, no matter where you're at, spouse, kids, anything else, that's when you see the fruits pour out. So that was that analogy. And my wife was on the scale for one funny video we did one time. And I yell, yell, it's like, I got on the scale and it's like, honey, are you fat? And then we did this big rant. So it was a series <laughs> we did for like four days on that. We tried to use the viral techniques to get video, but we've just learned overall, we just need to be consistent and available. So it's the same thing even in there. Like Mr. B said it best. He's like, he has 40 million YouTubers watching. It's not because he went over and was always viral. He just did a hundred sucky videos and changed one thing each and every day to make it better. And by the time four years came in and that fortitude, he was still faithful to YouTube, even though he had haters available. He was teachable by the videos he went on watched, and he was a servant to his community and what they're asking for. And they, now he's one of the most richest YouTubers. I think he's at 300 million a year that he makes. And he's 22. If we took those same attributes that he did and take the facts and put it forward, we can now serve in all those three communities very, very well. I mean, if I had 300 million right now, whoo, man, I'd be doing <laughs> so much for our community right now. <laughs> so, you know, in regards to what are the fats or what is fats, and then you have these books that you have, you know, that you show, and I was looking at some of them. And I'm seeing, okay, there's, there's some themes here going on. So 
you know, the, the, the language, the love language, the five love languages, you've got, you know, every, you've got mindset, you've got a variety, you've got a mix here. Are you really, is that part of, you mentioned books in, in what you're doing with live and learn. Of course, that makes a lot of sense. Learn. And, and I know that you and your wife have authored a book, at least one. Um, the, the books here, are, are, do you suggest reading lists? Do you do book club type things? What is it that you do with that? Each of our books we go over and publish and eventually we'll have eight books. The first book was Leave No Marriage Behind, Leave No Family Behind. The goal was end of last year, then COVID kicked in. We're hoping the end of this year. We try to publish each December, but that didn't work out last year. So we're hoping then this is this year is that there's so much wisdom out there. Marriage. You know, you could say Daniel Faust has 86,000 marriage books just on Amazon alone. Why are you going to go write a marriage book? The thing was is that there was no one good book. There was a lot of different resources. So what we go over and do is we take the best of the best. And just like our podcast, we give credit where credit's due. And then we say, hey, these are the things that we implemented. Here's some resources to go. If anybody remembers the Encyclopedia Britannica from back in the 80s, we used to reference those things and go over and say, this is our wisdom. You know, so that's what I did in that first book with me and my wife, is that what things helped us thrive in our marriage? What happened from year seven in the spiritual hoo-hoo kicking to going over to year 12 to now thriving? I don't know your audience. That's why I don't say the word. Well, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I said, it on, I said it on my TED talk because it was a bold audience, but you never know who's audience. But anyway, that happened to me. Literally, I felt I got kicked there and all the stupidity of my mouth and my mind and my soul and my emotions all came out that day. So it felt like I got kicked there because you get the wind taken out of your sails when you get there. Everybody laughs when you get kicked there, but the person there is not laughing. They're retrospectively no. thinking, why did I get kicked there? And they're evaluating every moment as that foot is coming at you. And that's what I did spiritually, mentally, emotionally that day in that argument. And I said, what do I need to do? So one of the chapters in our book is doctorate degree. We tend to get a doctorate degree in education. That carries seven years max. And I'm in education training rep. It, after seven right. years, it changes. It's sometimes, depending on the degree, because I did IT background for 15 years, it changes in 18 months or less. So why not invest a doctorate degree in your spouse? Why not invest a bachelor's degree in your kids? Why not invest an associate's degree with the people I'm connecting with? When I invest in those relationships at that type of educational level, fervency, time, and... Uh-oh. I don't know, guys, is he frozen for you? He just froze for me. Um, he'll be back. I am sure I am getting a lot out of that. I will tell you right now that one of the things that he just said, some, you know, there are so many words of wisdoms and nuggets that this gentleman, uh, Daniel, our, our service hero today, Daniel Fouts, you know, he's just, he's giving us hello. He's giving us so many nuggets. And, and I, I was just sharing with the audience that, I, and, and I want to go back to this, however, the idea of investing and then putting that equation in there and so that our minds can understand, because sometimes we can give our minds a little bit of a hazy direction in that we're being a little abstract. And I can be the worst one at that. I'm total disclosure on that. You know, I'm very big, big thinker and I get really like, okay, let's do this. And yet we have to focus and then we need to be able to translate it through the proper words and something that our machine, our brain is going to be able to utilize and then say, oh, okay, I get what you're saying. You're saying this. And so we will go through and we're going to make that happen. The fact that you were equating the, the, you know, the doctorate in on, you know, your, let's say your spouse, the, the masters in on whatever it may be, you know, and bachelors and associates and all of those things in that equation, that, that, that degree, you know, mm -hmm. investing into these relationships at a degree. I mean, people say that, but you're really taking it one step further. Brilliant. Brilliant. I love that. 
The main reason I say that is, is at the end of your life, you know, you, you're married five seconds or 50 years. My goal is 80 years and I'm going to die. My wife said I could die at 105. So I'm cutting off. <laughs> so when I get to 105, what legacy do I want to carry in that regard? I might take you out in a couple seconds if I don't have you breathe. <laughs> Oh, I like your wife. You know, let's bring her picture up one more time. What is her name? Michelle. Michelle. I like you, Michelle. You you know, she's she's given. She, well, not everybody has an expiration date, you know. Um, and, and, and in joking about this, though, you know, it, you guys seem to have that kind of relationship. You are investing in on it. And and that discussion, the 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 fact that you're talking so openly about so many items and things, is that something when you were talking about you almost lost your family or your marriage, was that something you learned after that or something you were already that was already implemented and there were other issues? Just you know, if you want to share, I'd love to know. Yeah, so basically from year one to year seven, I was spiritually toxic. My mouth was just spewing everywhere. All the brokenness from my parents' divorce, my brother's death, and being sexually molested between 8 to 15 culminated to me just putting a wall up. I went into active duty, and six years, hey, you can avoid a lot of issues. You can just stick in boardroom and living room relationships, and I had no experience in the bedroom relationships. I became a Christian, but I could hear all the ethereal, you know, principles of marriage and family and everything else, but no one really taught you how to apply it per se. You get an occasional person that would mentor you, but did, that didn't happen. So I got married at 25 and she took off the mask, became true and authentic. And I think that happens a lot with marriages. For me, I was already authentically nasty. So I just already had the mask ripped off. So. But the thing was, it got worse in marriage. I was just a verbal spewer. So if the days went good, I would uplift up. If the days were bad, I would uplift down. I went to this DNA relationship cycle of abuse. Tension would build up, pressure, something would trigger. We get into an argument, uh, verbal fisticuffs, everything else. Try to patch it with sex, gifts, those types of things, and went to that same cycle. That's why some of the pictures of those books is some of the things I've applied. And I kept doing that. And that seven year mark was the culmination of all that stuff. So I had to go the next five years and say, I've been doing everything wrong. I'm taking this jewel of my, of my wife and smashing her to bits. And I had to go over and say, I've been doing this for years. And where did I learn this from? Where did this stuff come from? So I had to do an introspective 30 year ripping of the veil and go through and like, I need to work through my brother's death. I need to work through my parents' divorce. I need to work through this type of stuff because this living room, bedroom ops I lived as a kid spewed into the next one. So if we take all the stuff that we've experienced and we don't get healing and release, then we carry that. And as military soldiers and first responders, we put all our passion and our fervency in the boardroom, but the most important thing is the bedroom and the living room. And I had to go rewrite everything. So it was a five-year ripping of the veil myself and getting that doctrine degree, reading book after book, seeing where I'm at, going to workshops and seminars, being vulnerable with people, going to counseling and those types of things. When my wife said recently, she's like, hey, I'd like to go to counseling for the next level. I'm like, all right, there's some things that I'm still peeling the onion about. I'm in session, I think, seven of 12 because I'm not diagnosable, so I only get 12. <laughs> you don't want to be diagnosable per se, but... It's been really revealing even then, like as the provider went over and said like, hey, your kids are older and these are some of the structures you need to bring in. So I'm still learning and living in that regard. But it took a process of going over and doing that. My wife even took like a three-year introspective look at her, not a three-year, three-month introspective look at her life because there was a lot of things from her past and her abuse that carried in there too. And she did that unveiling and she, she gets it way faster than I do. So I'm a little more harder than rocks type guy. But I'm always investing. She's more like, hey, 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 you know, massive explosion. So we're both doing it, but we're doing it at a pace of trying to come together and become as one in that regard. Because that's what's going to carry in the long run. So we want to have a legacy marriage because we can't pour it. We don't want to be that person 25 years famous and all this other stuff. 
and then my marriage is going wrong. There's some stories right. even today in the news. I'm not going to name names, but there was a recent guy that was really prominent in a place, and he's like, well, he has infidelity, and now he's taking a sabbatical. And I'm like, how long did he invest into that spiritual boardroom in a sense, but forgot about the bedroom in the living room? I don't want to be that person that's of faith, and you can choose where you want to go, but I don't want to be that man of faith and go over and not live that out. I'll never force it on anybody, but I never want to be that guy that's like, oh, you're the hypocrite. I want to be that shining example because I want you to see both, the life transformation. And if you get to see my faith too, that's another piece I can share with you. I I appreciate you sharing all of this. I absolutely do. And I can right now think in terms of so many people, you know, I, I was raised in San Diego. Need I say more? You know, uh, Navy Town. And and so, you know, yes, around the military family and, and extended family and you and first responders in my life. And, and, you know, you've got a certain and that's a certain kind of mindset as you look at the mindset books. And a lot of that is maybe post-traumatic stress because of what they've seen. It could be a variety of different things. And, and, and there's so many different ways we could go down this loop right now because of the fact that you're hitting on a lot of information. And I can see why it is that you're on the podcast and, and having the show because there, there's such a need to be able to look at these items and dive deeper in the you know the post-traumatic stress because of a, a, a incident let's just say and then did that trigger something from the youth and how do you deal with that have someone come in and explore i can see how that would be very very interesting and extremely beneficial for the audience that is looking to, you know, for help because our statistics are such that they're giving up. And right now, you know, we don't, I don't even want to start looking and seeing if they're getting worse because of what we're dealing with. Um, and so I want to say thank you again, Service Hero. Um, and you mentioned something I want to go there before we, we, we give you a little bit of center stage. You mentioned TED Talk. I would love to know, what was your TED Talk about? It was a TEDx talk about a week ago. I'm supposed to have another one in November, but my initial TED Talk was marriage and family and looking at it from the difference between contractual and also covenantal. So we tend to, like, if you read Pew Research Group, we want to do contractual type marriage, you know, live together, cohabitation, everything else. But at the end of the day, we want to be covenantally connected. And I didn't even bring it from a faith piece. I'm like, why do we secretly want to be married, but we stay, you know, you know, cohabitation in that? And I brought it from, I see that a lot of our viewpoints of where we saw the bedroom and living room was played out as a kid is why we view what it is in the 21st century in that particular regard. So I tied it all together to say, here's the lies that I went over and believed from my parents' divorce, brother's death, and those things and why I believe and believe. And then I challenged the audience to say, to rethink on why they make the decisions, what they do, to empower them and not to live in the lies that they lived in. Like I lived in a lie that when my mom left is that don't get close to anybody because if you do, they're eventually going to leave you. So keep that surface relationship and keep distance. So I kind of did that for years. So when I said, you know, because that day was do that then my brother died and i said screw to god and everything in that particular day and then i went to a military an agnostic atheist angry dude so those six years since i didn't have the bedroom and living room ops and it was by myself relationships were fun you know because we keep that distance in the boardroom we're like oh well uh -huh. i tolerate them eight hours six hours whatever and that's it but when you get in the bedroom and living room ops you don't get to go over and say, like, oh, it's a work day. It's over. You know, the relationship's still there. You wake up with that person the next day. Same thing with your kids. You know, 18 to 20 years, sometimes longer. So <laughs> yeah. I decided, I'm like, I need to go over and rewrite that. And that was my TED Talk in a nutshell. I didn't go as much in depth of the sexual trauma and everything else because that talk wasn't going towards that. But I gave a visit from where my life was as a case study example and what we can learn from mine. And then what you can go over and glean off and grow. So that was the summary of it. And and have and that was a virtual stage since it was uh, correct recent. And has it been aired yet? 
Uh, it was, they're still, Ted's still learning the virtual world, so they did a Zoom. I don't know about, they said it would go to TED.com and YouTube and everything else, but their team is still working on that. The actual physical one is in November. They're still doing it kind of in person but virtual, like they're doing the social distance CDC rules and whatnot. Everybody's going to have like a red carpet space they sit in, but then right. geographic. But yeah, there's supposed to be two in that regard. So I got blessed with that just for being transparent with somebody and networking connecting a couple of years ago. So that was a really great opportunity because I know people are going over and going through that stuff. And, and, and which TEDx location was it quote unquote? Uh, Cause I know that they have locations and so what, which one was it? It was TEDx Fountain Hill and Vail. They both did a synonymous group they're still running it each week they're doing how has COVID shaped us in many different ways so they have about eight to ten speakers on a wednesday and a sunday and you can dive in into that topic in an interactive group they actually allow you to come into the zoom and ask questions and then they yeah so they're trying to do that type of thing it's like how do i make it dynamic and interactive so they did it via zoom you know so that's the reason why i think they're taking a little longer on getting the recordings because they're not used to doing that type of stuff so this is yes. experimental. Ted's giving an experimental six months on taking it to the virtual level. I love it. And so, you know, thank you for sharing that. And congratulations. That's wonderful. Well, you, you know, to have that as a, as a, on your resume, if you will, you know, your experience and in this experience itself. Now, you know, before I give you the center stage here, I want to ask, because you've mentioned it a few times about your brother's death, what happened? It was 1997, it was May. I'm a big dates guy. So March 8th of 1997, we moved from uh, Rhode I uh, Central Falls, Rhode Island to North Smithfield, Rhode Island. So my dad's divorce like, expedited the goals he wanted to do. He was waiting to buy a house. Once the divorce came through, he bought a house. Mm -hmm. He wanted to get better stuff for my brother. My brother was mentally retarded, needed special care and whatnot. And the city I lived in was ghetto fabulous. We loved it, but for educational purposes, it didn't work out. So we moved up to North Smithfield, and I was commuting from school back and forth. It wasn't right. I was in the wrong city. I, my dad snuck me down each and every day to school. So those, those, those two years, um, we were doing that. But the first 60 days, my brother was getting settled in. He was going to the school he was supposed to because school choice didn't exist back then. You had to go to your state school or whatever. But... He went to this school. I went somewhere else. We got into an argument the morning of. It was May 29th of 1997. He always sets the alarm and then shuts it off like two seconds after. And I'm the dragger of sleep. And I'm like, I yelled at him again. I'm like, couldn't you give me five minutes, blah, 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 blah. That was the last argument I ever had with him. And I wish I didn't because it's such a waste now reflecting 20 years back. Went to school. Got picked on at school. That was a daily thing go over and then get the bus get the bus home. I took the public bus home. Sister then brings me home. 30 minutes later, my sister gets a call from my dad that Stephen was in a drowning accident. My father floors it to the hospital. Then we eventually go to the hospital. And at 6.35, he died. And then he came back to life. So they're like, let's send him to the children's hospital. So because he's 17. But that particular day at that point it was just a degraded death so it was like spike back up go to the hospital heart rate slower slower brain activity slower slower and by 10 35 that night he died and that day my mental emotional spiritual i mean it wasn't a christian then i just broke and those next three days were hell and it was to the point that at the funeral me and my cousin were standing in the back and he had such an amazing experience, my brother. He was called the spider. He basically, when he played basketball, he would cover you anywhere. <laughs> you couldn't get past him. I mean, he could have been NBA material if you were allowed to use appendages while playing. I don't think you're allowed to, but if you could, you could go over and do that. He, he, he could slam dunk, do all these crazy things, but he would have an IQ of an eight-year-old because he was mentally retarded. So I found out later on he got invited to go to this reservoir to swim. He's an avid swimmer, but not a strong, strong swimmer. Like, you know, go to the pool, go to the beach, that type of thing, but not like Olympic. So they pushed him in. He got caught in an undertow. The undertow sucked him in, and it took them 15 minutes to recover him. 
So from the time from running to parents' house, calling emergency services, getting over, stuff like that, come to find out the two kids that did that, they were laughing about it and they were actually happy he was dead. And they said yeah. that at the funeral. Uh -huh. I was in a murderous state, at least in my mind. I still remember the address of the day, and I don't need to say it publicly, but I went straight to the address that, that couple days later with my five-speed bike, just wrestling with what to do with the situation. It wasn't good wrestling. It was bad wrestling mentally, you know, where I was going. At. So I wasn't, I wasn't thinking, like, hugs and kisses. And then I sat there for a few minutes, and then I'm like, this would be completely asinine. I'm not sure if it was God or what. I decided to go bike away from that. But from that moment on, I just became fill the hole. God's not important, all these other things. I'm going to fill everything to fill that gap. And I did that from 1997 until about 2002, even with the military. And it was in 2002 that this guy told me how much I sucked and how much I needed Jesus. And that's when I started to transform and work through that, my brother's death. And then on a deployment, it finally came clear. And I asked God, I said, I should have died that day. My brother was more important. Because I always thought since I was the last, I was the least important. And he told me, he said, the reason why I kept you here is to teach the world better relationships. So this thing of learn and live and work your superhero is the culmination of what he kept me here for. Now, I don't know what else the death was used for. But I always believe that even all the bad things, COVID and everything else is used for the good of what the whole plan of his plan is. So for me, I'm like, I'm leveraging that and saying, I never want him to die. I know God doesn't want him to go over and die, but sometimes this situation is just like, you think a mother's against drunk driving. Yeah, we didn't want that person to die in there, but now mother's against drunk driving has done such great things because of it. And it inspired them to do that. And that's the same thing. It's the same thing with my parents' divorce. All those things, I'm like, I wouldn't be so passionate about relationships if I didn't go through those cycles. I even wrestled it myself. So that's the story. And then the reason why I do the things I do is that I want no marriage, no family, no relationship left behind. If I can um, help heal and connect with people, and if I'm not the best person, let's connect you with the people that are best to help you to grow. Wonderful. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to give you a few moments. I'm going to take myself down from the line, and I'm going to let you share a nugget, a thought, something, you know, something that you feel right now is that the the audience needs to hear and then i'll come back and then we'll close out the show okay okay so thank you for going over and watching you guys uh, i think the nugget of wisdom i want to go over and share is it's covid the season's been crazy there's race riots there's school stuff there's everything else but i want to remind you this one thing just like i said in my ted talk you're not alone you don't need to go over and struggle. If you're struggling in your marriage, I've been there. If you're struggling in your family, I've been there. If you're struggling in your leadership, I've been there. And I want to go over and be a conduit to go over and help. So if you're struggling in any of those realms, I'd love to go over and connect with you. You can find us on Facebook. You can go over and find us on Twitter. Find us on the Easy Way Wall, wherever you want to go and find. I don't want you to go over and wait. And if we're not the best fit for you, we want to connect you to go over and thrive because we just don't want you to go over and survive. We lose 22 veterans a day. We lose two active duty. We lose about 35 first responders. And typically, we lose ourselves because of all the stressors, either in the bedroom, living room, boardroom. Don't go over and wait until everything goes over and goes. So wherever you're at, we love to go over and serve. So that's where my heart is, and I hope that goes over and helps you, is that you're not alone, and we're here to go and help you. Thank you. I love it. And, you know, I am going to bring this up ever so quickly that you are a part of the Easy Way group, um, that you are on the, the Wall of Fame and, and the shout out to the Zulis and, and Eric and Jim. Love you guys. And uh, so as we start to close this show, I, I want to I wanna give a shout out to you seriously for what you're doing daniel that you you are you have a, a an audience and a group of people that need to be able to see strong and i'm going to say it men that have a heart that see the value of being able to put their heart into their investing into their their family their wives their kids their you know and 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 into 
like you said, the, the bedroom and the living room. And so I want to personally say thank you because I have personally known a lot of people that you are serving that have had struggles in that area and they need your example. And so personally from Tamara Hunter, I want to say thank you for that. And, at, and as we close today, the Service Hero Show, 365 days of awesome celebrate success through service. Yes, Daniel Best. We have determined and we have made the case you are a service hero. Thank you, Tamara Lanan, for uh, nominating this amazing man. Like I just said personally, he is truly serving a community and more. He is serving all and he doesn't want anybody to feel alone. But in particular, there are those that are our first responders, that are our current military and are our veterans that are looking to get back into society and possibly struggling and with what's happening today on August the 8th it, there is even that much more of a struggle the journey is that much more unnest un, un, unclear and that journey right now has a few if you will rocks and pivots that need to take place and so rocks that we need to get overcome and pivots that need to take place so I want to say thank you for being the service hero that you are well thank you and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and today is Saturday. So all of the buddies that have been here with us and will be watching this, that means that Barbara Beckley, the diamond, is back tonight. I have confirmed she will be over our chat at 5 o'clock Pacific, 8 o'clock Eastern in the Chemo Buddies for Life community group. So if you're not a part of the community, come join us. Barbara Beckley will be leading a chat, a discussion about Saturday successes. And so you find us here on Facebook at Chemo Buddies for Life. Go to groups, go to the community, ask to join. We have two requirements that it is a safe place and what takes place there stays there. We share a lot of humor, hope, heart, hugs, and a whole lot of love. See you there. All right. Thank you so much, Daniel, for being here on the show. You're welcome. Bye, everyone. <laughs>